This podcast is not meant to be professional advice of any kind. It is meant to be informative and entertaining. If you make any changes to your life, see the appropriate professional before you do so. Hello, and welcome to SuperAge. My name is David Harry Stewart. I'm the founder of Aegist. At SuperAge, we help you live better and become the best version of yourself. And who doesn't want a SuperAge, right? Today's show is brought to you by Inside Tracker, the dashboard to your inner health. Go to insidetracker.com slash ages, save 20% on all their products. Today's show is also brought to you by Element, L-M-N-T, my favorite electrolyte mix. It's what I put in my water in the morning, and it's what I put in my water at the gym. Go to drinkelement.com slash ages and receive a free eight-serving sample pack with your first purchase. And this week, we also welcome a new exciting sponsor to the program, Timeline Nutrition, with their product, MitoPure, the first clinically tested urolithin A supplement. Go to TimelineNutrition.com slash Ageist, use the code Ageist at checkout, and save 10% off your first order of MitoPure. Welcome to episode 108 of the Super Age Podcast. It's great to have you with us. This will be dropping on November the 9th, 2022. So this month on the Super Age Podcast, we're kind of working a theme, which is physical fitness and the body. And we talk so much about the body here, but it's really, everything sits on our bodies, right? Including our heads. <laughs> and our ability to imagine our futures, our ambitions, our behaviors, all of these things sit upon how we feel about our bodies. So we're going to have a number of experts on this month talking about how to train our bodies. As so I'm talking about how we feel about our bodies, I'm not talking about how do we feel looking in the mirror? Although that's part of it. It's more, how do we feel about our ability to move our body around during the day? How do we feel about our health and longevity looking forward? Um, that's what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, we've had people on here who are very interested in the sport of bodybuilding, and that's great. Um, you know, I, th I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I, I am personally interested in function. So, I'm, I'm kind of fine the way I look. Um, I want to be able to do things with my body. That's what, that's what I feel really good about. So one of the things I, I want to emphasize here is that um, a lot of us have a lot of challenges. You know, we have health challenges, and I am not immune from this. I am 63, and things start to happen, right? Um, we start to feel like maybe we're invisible, maybe we don't count, what is this whole age thing? How are we going to do it? It's a confusing time. You know, if we think back when we were teenagers and we're now whatever age we are, my guess is we didn't think it was going to look like this. And now that we're here and, you know, what, what is it? It can be a little disorienting and it can be very challenging for really all of us. So um, I do not want to minimize that. Um, I totally get that. Um, and I'm with you guys on that. So what I have been doing is the last, say, I want to say since April. So that's about 26 weeks or so, a week off here and there. I have been doing something, uh, a program designed by Joel Jameson. And we're having Joel on the program today. And Joel is the OG master strength and conditioning guru. Um, number of world champions in a number of sports. And his program was recommended to me by uh, Nick Holt, who's a trainer I really um, respect. He's got a lot of knowledge. And he said, yeah, you should check out Joel's thing. So I did. Um, now, I'm, I have no financial relationship with Joel. Um, the Eight Weeks Out program is uh, self-directed. There's a vast number of videos. And I think the program was like 99 bucks. It was like the best 99 bucks you can spend if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, and what it does is it, it, it sort of um, ladders up and sequences various kinds of aerobic conditioning along with strength conditioning. And when I first saw this program, I thought, wow, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I'm 63 years old. Um, I'm in reasonably good health. But, I mean, this is designed for... At, like real athletes, <laughs> much, much younger athletes. 
And so it was a little intimidating, um, but I started it and I did it. So um, I've now been doing it and it sort of ratchets up every week, very, very slowly. You don't really even realize it. Um, so I've, I've been doing it for quite a while now. And, um, you know, there are a couple others. So there's the, the program itself. And then there's a thing you wear on your wrist in the morning to check your HRV, which is heart rate variability and your resting heart rate. This lets you know how much stress your body is under and how well or well not you have recovered. I think this is a uh, fantastic device. There's a lot of other wearables out there that measure HRV. I, I don't know. I think they're kind of bonkers because they don't. They're, it's like an average over a period of time using some kind of algorithm. This is like this is what it is right now, this point in the day. So I find that very useful. And then it comes with a, a chest strap similar to, you know, like a polar heart rate monitor um, to help you monitor your heart rate zones. Some people say, well, you know, I don't need one of these things. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm, I, I like to measure things. And especially if I'm doing something, you know, aerobic that needs to be within a certain zone, it's really helpful to know, like, what's your heart rate? And as I like to tell people, feelings are not facts. <laughs> I may think that my heart rate's really high, and it's not, or it may be reverse. Who knows? Um, so um, that's how it goes. And so I'm, I'm not to brag here, just to sort of, like, level set what has happened to me is that my resting heart rate went from about 55 um, when I started this to now... If I'm on a rest day, it'll be 49. Um, my heart rate recovery, my HRV, was somewhere in the you know mid 60s. It's now on an, on an off day, it's about 80. Um, and I can do um, I can do 100 push-ups straight through, and I can do pull-ups till like the end of time. Um, and th- these are, <laughs> you know. I astonish myself, um, truthfully, because these are the sort of things that this is like 90th percentile for people, you know, like a man in his mid thirties and I'm, I'm going to be 64 in a few weeks. So the reason I'm saying all this is not to say like, I'm some awesome athlete and I do this amazing thing. Really? It's just diligence. You just sort of do it every day. You train every day, whether you're doing Joel's program or somebody else's program. And To let you guys know that, like, we can just do, like, amazing things. We can do, like, amazing things. And we are often told that we can't. And we may have challenges. We may have health challenges. We may have, you know, all kinds of stuff that sort of, you know, life's real. And it gets gets extra real as you put a few years behind you. Um, But, you know, when somebody says to you, do you really want to be doing this at your age? Can you be doing this? You know, maybe you should, shouldn't do this. When somebody says that to me, it's like the hackles go up on the back of my neck. And, you know, just a little background on me. When I, when I was growing up, um, my family and the people around me told me that I, you know, wasn't very smart. I wasn't very capable. Not much. I was never going to really amount to much. Um, and so sort of my mission in life was formed by that, that anytime I come up against somebody saying, you shouldn't do that, you know, you're too old, you're too this, you're too that, or I hear that being said to someone else, um, I get activated. So that's my story. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we've all got a story, right? In fact, if you've got a story, send it to me. I would love to hear what's, what your story is. What, what's fundamentally motivating you in your life? That, that would be a good thing for us to talk about. Um, we're going to get with Mr. Joel Jameson in just a moment after a quick word from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Timeline Nutrition and their breakthrough product, MitoPure. We all know how important mitochondrial energy is, and especially maintaining muscle and strength as we age. Urolithin A, which is found in MitoPure, has been clinically proven to increase muscle strength and endurance with no other changes in lifestyle. Urolithin A is essentially upgrading your body's cellular power grid, giving your body the energy it needs to optimize. We've been testing MitoPure here with the SuperAge team, and our findings are aligned with those clinical studies. 
This is a product that I'm going to be taking every day for as long as I can. It's become an essential part of my routine. Timeline is offering listeners of this podcast 10% off your first order of MitoPure. Go to timelinenutrition.com slash ageist and use the code ageist to get 10% off your order. That's T-I-M-E-L-I-N-E-N-U-T-R-I-T-I-O-N dot com slash ageist. Maybe check out their starter pack, which has all three formats, and let me know what you think. Today's show is also brought to you by Inside Tracker, the dashboard to your inner health. I've been using Inside Tracker for a few years now, and I'm a big fan of regularly doing blood tests to see, first of all, am I optimizing myself the way I think I am? And second of all, is there something going on that I need to know about right away? Um, you know, back about 12, 13 years ago, I was in my routine physical. And suddenly, luckily, I had a physical at that point in time, my blood platelet level had plummeted, and I found myself in a hospital three weeks later. Now, it was only by luck that I happened to be having a physical at exactly that point. If I had had that physical maybe three months later, some really bad stuff could have happened. Um, so Inside Tracker, I use to help optimize where I'm at and also to, you know, Make sure nothing bad's going on out there to keep myself informed of what is actually going on in my body. The other thing I really like about Inside Tracker is, you know, there are other blood tests out there that you can take and it'll, you know, it'll give you levels and say like, okay, this is where you're at in range, out of range, but it doesn't tell you like what to do about it. With Inside Tracker, it's a food first program, um, supplements when needed to help get you back on track. It gives you actions where you can actually impact what your inner health is. This is a great platform. This is not a replacement for seeing your physician, which you should do regularly, at least every year. This is an additive. I strongly recommend it. Go to insidetracker.com slash ageist. Save 20% on all their products. Today's show is also brought to you by Element, the electrolyte mix that I've been using to stay hydrated and to keep my electrolytes in balance. I started placing Element Electrolyte Mix into my water after my workouts on the recommendation of a friend of mine who's a 50-time Ironman competitor. I told him that I was having a lot of trouble recovering from my workouts, and I thought it was my age. And it turned out it was my electrolytes. And once I started putting Element into my water, I noticed an incredible difference in my ability to recover from my workouts. It went from, I mean, truthfully, an hour or two to like 10 minutes. Um, because the problem was my electrolytes were off. Now what I do is I put Element in my water when I get up first thing in the morning. I also have it in my water that I drink during the day. And then, of course, at the gym, I make sure that there's Element in my water. And, of course, in my beloved sauna, the same thing, Element in the water. So it turns out that some of that brain fog and just muscle ache and sluggishness that I was feeling was not age-related. It was actually electrolyte related. We talk a lot about hydration on this podcast, but the electrolyte mix within that water is really critical. Right now, Element is offering listeners of this podcast a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try out all eight flavors and share Element with a salty friend. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash ages. This deal is only available through this link. You must go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash ageist. We'll be leaving that link in the show notes too. After you check it out, let me know what you think about it. Did it make the change for you that it did for me? Hey, Joel, how you doing today? Doing great. It is such an honor and a privilege to have you on the show today. Um, you're in my world, you are like the OG of <laughs> strength and conditioning. Um, we have a lot of people on this program who have a lot of letters after their names, and they don't know anything about your world. They, When they talk to me about it, it's just nonsense. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to have you on and um, talk through some of this stuff. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. It's, it is funny. I think that there's a disconnect, unfortunately, between the really – highly educated scientific minds who go really, really deep into a very narrow topic. And then 
people like myself, I can't give you the biochemistry nearly to the level that they can, or, or I'm not doing the research, but I can tell you the application side of it. And I try to educate myself as much as I can on their level. But I think a lot of those scientific people are really, really amazing what they do, but they don't really get into the like, okay, how do we apply this to the real world and, and the people that are actually out there doing the work? Uh, that's right. I would never ask those people what to do in the gym. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, most of them, you can, you know, not all of them, there's a lot of them that just don't do any of the gym themselves. So, right. you know, that's just not their background. So tell us a little bit about your background, Joel. Sure. I got, I got started late nineties, kind of early two thousands in the strength conditioning realm. Um, kind of a, a football player who realized I was never going to go pro, but really liked the process and, and loved training from a young age. And uh, kind of my senior year of college, I went down to the weight room there. There was a, a strength coach named Bill Gillespie, great strength coach, and just kind of said, hey, I really want to intern and, and work with you in any way possible because I'd been so fascinated by the field. I'd read everything I could find to read, and I read a bunch of the Russian material and just kind of a bunch of obscure stuff that he was super interested in. So he said, yeah, come on down. So I spent a bunch of time in the University of Washington there, Division One football program with him, went to the Seahawks for about a year, year and a half with him as well, and another strength coach named Kent Johnston, um, and decided, you know, I didn't really want to play the the musical chairs game of pro sports strength conditioning because every you know year there's a shuffle in the NFL of who's working for what team, and you might be out of a job if you don't get in that shuffle. So I opened a gym uh, in 2003. I was 23 years old. Um, thought I knew everything I needed to know about training. Figured I'd I'd get business figured out as I went along. And a couple of things happened. The, the first one, the major one was the gym I opened was next door to an, a mixed martial arts gym. And I didn't know a whole lot about mixed martial arts, but I, you know, I had athletes coming over very quickly from when I opened the door to ask if I trained them for world championship fights. And I was like, yeah, no problem. But I, I realized very quickly, I didn't actually know anything about conditioning when I started training for those guys myself, because I was monstrously stronger than them but they were kicking my ass in 30 seconds because I was completely gassed out. I had very poor conditioning relative to what they did. And so it was this big eye opening thing of, wow, I, I, there's a whole part of fitness. I have no clue about because I'd been so strength focused and just kind of dismissed the metabolic conditioning as something you do at the end of a workout or something you do in the preseason before a train camp or at the end of practices. Like I just realized how little I knew about the metabolic side of things. And so I, you know, I said, I'm going to help these athletes perform and, and they're counting on me. So I'm going to learn everything I can possibly learn about metabolic conditioning and energy systems and that end of the game. And so I did that. I spent years and years studying that, training fighters of all different levels and also just, you know, Microsoft executives covered in Seattle and, and people with stressful jobs. And, you know, I basically found that the, the metabolic side, the, the conditioning, the aerobic piece was just such a huge piece of the puzzle, no matter what your goal was. And so I dove into that and, and that translated into starting an online company eight weeks out. And that translated into a whole bunch of other opportunities to, to speak for, uh, to speak at different workshops and conferences throughout the world, to write for magazines, to consult with different groups from lifetime fitness to military special forces groups, to different organizations in China and Japan and Australia and the UK and kind of all over the place. Um, and that just kind of grew from there. So at this point, you know, my, my goal is really to help not just athletes who want to perform better, but individual people that want to perform better, which to me, performance is living a healthy, long life where you're free of disease and you can do all the things that you love doing. And, and that's really my focus. Now, along the way, I've dove, dove into some technology that, that some of your listeners may be familiar with, heart rate variability. I was introduced, introduced to that in the early 2000s and launched an app in 2012, which is a, a really, really powerful technology if you know how to use it right. And so my, my career has kind of intersected the education, the technology, and just the big picture of longevity, performance, and, and overall health. Um, and so that's, that's the big picture, about 20, 20 years or so now of, of doing this. And I'm learning, I'm learning new stuff all the time. And that's the great thing about this field, as you probably know, there's, there's always more to learn. The human body is so fascinating and, and complex that we can always get better at doing this. And there's always something to keep diving into and learning more about. So it's, it's been a great, uh, great journey so far. And I'm really enjoy how the, the idea of human performance, um, you know, with an elite athlete. Um, okay. That's one thing. Um, but then with people who just want to live longer and healthier, that's the performance that really counts. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, again, the kind of more I've dug into this, you know, particularly in the last, I don't know, year or two, the more you realize the underpinnings are the same because they're metabolic. The, it's the aerobic energy system. It's the ability to recover from the stress of your environment that drives that. Now, elite athletes have a much different environment than somebody who's not playing sport at all, but life itself is stressful. And it's, it's our body's ability to adapt to that stress and come out on the other side stronger rather than worse off for it. That to me drives how we feel, how we age, how we look, how we perform and, and everything. So again, it's, it's this kind of that worldview and, and looking at data of HRV and different biomarkers over time has, has just kind of shaped my view of how important, you know, this whole piece of, of metabolic function, metabolism, conditioning, and, you know, how it fits in with strength and movement and all these pieces come together. But to me, at the end of the day, performance is the ability to adapt to your environment and do so successfully, because as soon as you lose that ability, you break down. And, and that's what we want to avoid as long as possible. And, and I, I think you wrote somewhere training is a way to push back on the aging process. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it 100% is, I think it's without question, you know, the, the people with all their initials behind your name, that study exercise will tell you the same thing, exercise, strength and conditioning and activity, all these things, they are tools to make our body more resilient to stress. And that's really, to me, fundamentally what they're doing. They are building the machinery of stress resilience, because again, our body has to constantly be adapting to the environment around us, whether that's mental and or physical stress. And, and most of us are under both of those things. And our body has to sense what that stress is. And then our body has to make ourselves resilient to that stress by making changes to them. So if we put ourselves under physical stress of lifting weights, our body changes by becoming stronger and able to tolerate that stress of the weightlifting greater and more effectively. If we put ourselves under the metabolic stress from doing conditioning and higher intensity type activities, well, then our metabolism looks at that and says, well, let's make our metabolism way more efficient. Let's make ourselves operate effectively without as much oxygen at rest. Let's do all these things to adjust our mitochondrial quality and do these things metabolically that just make us able to withstand that metabolic stress. So stress is a tool that we use through training to make our bodies better at dealing with more stress. And because there are general components of stress, meaning there are commonalities between mental and physical stress, and everything in between building that general machinery for stress and stress resilience translates into a broad category of our ability to tolerate that as we go through our lives and slow down the aging process. Cause to me, again, aging is really just an accumulation of, of uh, the stress over our course of our lives and ultimately where body loses the ability to adapt to it. And then we start the declining process. So if we can make our bodies much more resilient, much more stress uh, capable, then we can delay that process significantly. And there's, there's research. I don't know if, who you've talked to that's kind of gone down this realm, but there's research shows you endurance athletes live like eight years longer than your average person. Like just generally moving around is like two to four out years. So there's, you know, really good research, both, you know, in the literature and just, anecdotally that, you know, you exercise is the single most powerful weapon, I would say that we have to build that stress resilience. And it's, it's hugely, um, you know, hugely beneficial for really everybody. There's nobody that doesn't benefit from exercise. Um, I, I want to, we've, we've used the word stress a lot. And mm -hmm. so this is something that I got from you, this idea that we all are allocated sort of a stress pie and the makeup of that pie is your physical stress, your emotional stress, and your mental stress. Sure. Um, and how all of these stresses, if not dealt with, will drive inflammation. Um, and you, you, you only get so much in a day. And if you go over that, you got a problem. Yeah. I mean, I think what it comes down to is, is our bodies are ultimately limited in some capacity to their response to stress just because our metabolisms can't produce some unending amount of energy and even, and even metabolism itself, right. Taking food and breaking it down, create energy, then using energy, even that process puts some stress on the body. So there, there's not just like you have this unending amount of cash to pay the bills. No, you have a finite amount of resources to pay the bills in life. Most people, most of us, and your metabolism also has a finite amount of energy it can create a day. And so it has to allocate that resource, right? And if you put your body under a huge amount of mental and or physical stress, something will pay the price and the body will allocate it to the things that it deems the most uh, crucial for you to, to survive right now. 
and it'll reallocate you know resources that you would like to go towards recovery and regeneration and growth and things that are important it'll take energy away from those things because those are less important in the immediate term so the body think about it because the body has a limited amount of resources it's constantly deciding do i spend my energy resources on things right now or do i spend my resources on things that will help me later and again that comes down to how much stress your body is under and the type of stress and how stress resilient you are to begin with and your genetics and all these variables play a big role in that but you need the body to obviously survive now but you want the body to also adapt to things that make you more resilient for the stress that's going to come later and that's how ultimately fitness works it it puts the body under specific types of stress that it adapts to and it improves your metabolic function it improves your muscle mass and strength it improves your co cognition and cognitive abilities and ultimately that makes us more resilient for later as we as we get older we're more resilient because we've we've developed those capacities um, let's spend a moment talking about recovery from stress. Sure. And um, I've done the eight weeks program and I don't know what you got in there, Joel, like uh, <laughs> many, many, many hours of videos that one watches before you even start the program. And the vast majority of those videos have to do with recovery. And so it, it seems like there's sort of two buckets of this. There's yep recovery from an immediate stressful event, um, be that the gym. Um, sure. And then there's sort of a longer term, like, I don't know what the, what the right word for it is, but sort of like a, the strategy on a daily or weekly um, basis to reduce overall stress. Um, let's, let's talk about the first one. Um, that skill set of being able to go from a highly sympathetic state, say yep. the gym, or you've had like a rough meeting or something and be able to dial that down. How do you train for that? Yeah. So like you said, we can consider stress as really just the body's response to the external environment. And that can be either real or imagined, right? Like paying your bills isn't a real stress. You're not going to be killed, hopefully, if you don't pay your bills. But we perceive that as a real stress and that has a direct impact on our body. So a stress is really anything that causes that sympathetic nervous system to activate and it's doing that in an effort to produce more energy because biologically speaking, if you're under a real physical stress, you know, i.e. someone's chasing you or a predator's chasing you, you need energy really quickly. So a stress or a stressor is really anything that activates that stress response. And of course, there are large degrees of that. So physical training is a very high stress because you're producing a lot of energy as a result of that. You know, sitting around thinking about something stressful might not have the same magnitude immediately, but it might last for hours on end. But just like you said, after your after that period of stress has passed, whether the workout's over or you're, you know, you're, you're moving on to different things mentally, you have to basically restore the body to the condition it was in before that stress started. And that requires turning off that sympathetic stress response system and turning on that parasympathetically driven recovery system. And again, because stress ultimately starts in the brain, right? It's a, it's a perception or it's, you know, the manifestation of the physical tool that you're going to go do. You have to learn how to mentally turn that switch from on to off on the stress response and then turn the recovery response or the parasympathetic response to on. So I use a lot of tools for it, but as, as you see in the program, doing it in the gym is a really powerful way because you can use your heart rate as a very powerful guide and feedback tool. When your heart rate's up, obviously it means you're producing more energy. You're burning more calories. When your heart rate comes back down, it means you're turning that sympathetic. It's not really a switch. It's a better way to think about this honestly is a dial. You're turning that dial back down so that the other side of it, the recovery response can turn that dial up. So these are, these are two dials that are basically being constantly adjusted by your body, but you have input into them, right? We can think about something stressful and turn the stress response dial up. We can think about something relaxing and we can turn that stress response down. We have control over this. So working out is a really great way to learn the skill. So I call it dynamic energy control. You can call it whatever you want, but it's this cognitive ability to regulate that stress. And again, it's different than gym because you're under a high level of stress. So if you can develop the ability to turn that off and on and manage that correctly in a workout by using your heart rate to go up and down and do these things and relax it develops that skill set that can translate over into real life as well. Now, it's not the only thing you need to do, but it's a really good and powerful skill and starting point to do is, is use that gym as a tool to not just go in there and go 
hundred percent the whole time and think that's the whole goal. It's also to learn that ability to turn on the energy when you need it and turn it back off when you don't. And that's kind of the, the short first step you want to get really good at. I find that really hard. <laughs> you know, I, I find at the end of a workout, my heart rate will be, you know, after I get off the, the cool down bike, maybe it's, if I'm, maybe it's down to a hundred. And then if I lay on a mat and I do some box breathing or something, maybe I can yep. get down a little more, but it's, ve- I, I, I don't know how to bring it down any lower than that. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's a combination of things. It's, it's genetics, it's fitness level, it's practice. It's, it's how much stress you were under all those things play a role in that. And over time you develop more capabilities to do that. But yeah, I mean, look, if you put yourself under a hugely stressful workout or, you know, a fairly hard workout, it's not going to drop instantly back down your rest and heart rate levels. That's going to take time because the the more you have basically what happened is your your body has this normal internal environment right where your your body temperature is in your normal ranges your ph and your oxygenation and all these things are in pretty normal ranges but when you disturb that that's that's homeostasis when you do a prolonged workout or a prolonged period of stress and you push that out of the normal ranges into what we call like the stress ranges the longer you do that the further outside of the ranges you go the longer it takes to come back down so that's just kind of general rule of thumb and the workouts and in, in the program you're going through, you know, there's definitely some, some in, deliberate intentional stress that's driving that result. Um, but it's, it's not just, again, it's not just your ability to turn that off immediately after the workout. It's your ability to manage with the rest of the stress of your lifestyle. And that's a big piece of this too. It's, you know, it's really important to get good at doing this stuff at the end of the workout in the gym. But if you're stressed out of your mind throughout the rest of your day and the rest of your life, that has such a huge impact because you're just, you're taking energy that should be going towards adapting to the work, workout. And you're using that instead to just deal with more stress in your lifestyle every day. And that's the problem, right? If you're, if you're trying to get as much as you can out of training, you need the energy to go towards that purpose and not just be, you know, shoved into all this mental stress and things that you're dealing with on a daily basis that's why the lifestyle component to me the lifestyle sets the limitations on what you can get out of your training that's really the best way to look at it it either dials up your ability to respond really effectively or it crushes it and makes it so that same workout will have very different effects if you can't muster the energy up to go towards the actual recovery which is where your body's adapting to that stress so the limit um the limiting factor here is the ability to recover yeah, absolutely. So I mean, like I said, what is recovery? Recovery, we can break stuff down to two, two kind of pathways people are probably familiar with. One is catabolic, right? Catabolic means you're taking the food you're, you're, or the foods the, or the stores of energy in your body and you're breaking them down into the energy you need. That's, that's a catabolic process. And that's what happens when you train and, and you're moving around. Those are, those are just breaking down macromolecules and the smaller ones your body can use. But then the other flip side of that is the anabolic piece. And that's where you are making new proteins and you are storing nutrients and you are building your body and regenerating cells and proliferating cells and all the stuff that we want to do to stay healthy. That's, that's the anabolic side. And that's what's happening when you're recovering. It's put the body under a catabolic stress, recovery in an anabolic state. And the anabolic state, again, is, is where our bodies are improving from a muscle and a strength and even metabolic standpoint and if you put your body under a lot of catabolic stress and you don't have the energy driven towards the anabolic side then you just get a lot of breakdown now this is where the 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 balance of fitness comes in right it's it's you want enough stress to make the body actually improve but you don't want so much that you can't recover from that because that's going to have negative consequences as well so that is the whole game it's it's applying the right amount of stress and again, that comes down to everything else in your life, because if you have an extremely stressful life, you might not be able to do a whole lot in the gym. If you've got a, a, a better handle on stress management outside the gym, then you can afford and you can recover from more stress in the gym. So you really have to look at both sides of it. You know, how much you need in the gym depends on how much you can, you know, uh, get out of your life. That's uh, going to drive recovery. What, what are some of the recovery strategies that you've seen work? And I'm, um, I'm again, I'm talking about sort of the longer term, not the immediate, I'm in the gym, I need to get my heart rate down, the, the sort of longer term things. What what have you seen that works? Yeah, I mean, look, it's really the big picture of lifestyle. It's not, I love, I know that there's a lot of series of tactics we can talk about, but look, you've got to get enough sleep. Sleep is 
the number one thing. If you're not getting sleep, like you're severely limited because that's when your body is the most recovery uh, driven and where it's allocating as much as resources because you're not moving, right? It's it's driving it towards there. So number one, you've, you've got to sleep. You know, number two, diet always plays a big role. You know, food and nutrient quality, the things you take in your body are going to have a dramatic impact on your ability to recover. And then the third one is really just your ability to mentally turn off that stress response in your daily life as much as you can. So it's just this lifestyle um, you know, factor. And and I go back and forth. I spent a good amount of the year in Hawaii and I spent a good amount of time, you know, in the Seattle area and the difference between being in a crowded city with people that are under pressure and stress and living on an Island environment where no one cares what's going on. They're just enjoying the day and they're relaxed. It's a hugely different thing mentally and emotionally and stressfully. And you can see it in my, I see it in my HRV. I see it in my health and my, you know, just overall outlook and, and feeling like it's, it's a massive difference. So it's really just kind of those three big picture, those three big pieces. And, and then it's, you know, tactics and details within that, like, you know, breathing and meditation and relaxation and, you know, all those things that you can do to add in strategies. But if you don't get sleep, you don't get nutrition and you don't get the general feel of your lifestyle and general lifestyle stress, the tactics are a lot less important because you're still limited by four hours of sleep. Like, I don't care how much breathing you do. If your sleep is terrible and your diet is horrible, the, the, you know, the breathing stuff you're doing is going to have a minimal impact. You've got to nail the big things first and really focus on those. And then you can start layering in all these additional recovery type modalities and strategies as you, as you want to. Uh, so as I mentioned before we get on the call, I think I, I started doing the eight weeks out program in the beginning of April at the recommendation of a good trainer friend of mine, Nick Holt. And, uh, he said this Jameson guy, like he knows what he's doing. You should try this. So I said, okay, <laughs> let's check this out. <laughs> so, uh, I've now done it for about 24 weeks. So the way, um, the way it's set up, there's, it's called eight weeks out. There's eight weeks. And then there's like a four week bonus. Yep. And then there's a level two, which when I first saw it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and then there's a bonus to level two. And so I have found this program remarkable. Um, and <laughs> it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on this program is that I was, I thought I was like, it's kind of okay. I mean, I was like okay shape for my age and stuff. You know, I'm 63 and I looked at this and I was like, whoa, I don't know if I can do this. And I did it. Um, and I think I had to take off at about the eight week part or like 10 week part. I had to take a week off um, that I was yep. just like too tired. And then I think I've taken another week off a couple of weeks ago. I just sort of stopped for like five days. Sure. But but otherwise, I've done the program. And uh, so uh, its effect on me has been profound. Um, I I do, st I train in my, in my gym and I live in Park City, Utah, the people who train in my gym, they're Olympians who train in there <laughs> and offspring of Olympians. <laughs> so they look at me and they say things like, what are you training for? Like, what, <laughs> how is it that you can do this? Like, so I can, a little bit of a brag here. I, I started out the program. I could only like 50 pushups was like a lot. That was really hurting. I did a few weeks ago. I did a hundred straight through. Um, and I can awesome. do pull-ups till the end of time uh <laughs> which is like and my recovery um my so the the effect of me on the you know the metrics we spoke about my resting heart rate if i'm if i'm training hard um the next day it'll be like 55 if i've taken a day or two off it'll be like 49 which is a that's a, great about a six beat improvement my hrv it started was like in the high 60s if I'm fully recovered, it's in the low 80s now. I mean, low 80s in the 60 age bracket has got to be, I can look at the numbers for you at some point. That's a couple of standard deviations above your, your population norm. Other people of your age that you know aren't doing this uh, or kind of your average age range and fitness levels, like you're probably two standard deviations, if not more above them. I mean, that's, that's a, a very, that, that's something that, you know, someone in their 30s would be pleased to see. So <laughs> it just shows you exactly what we're talking about. You you can push back, right? You, there are there are ways to yeah. do it. But but the but the thing, Joel, is now this is what I want to ask you about. The program yeah. is stacked in a way that I am very rarely sore. Yep. I'm 
I am, I have massive workouts and I'm very rarely sore. So talk to me about the sort of the, the mojo that you've got going on there. There's the aerobic and the different sort of aerobic zones that yeah. are happening in the beginning and how it's tied to um, heart rate variability, the HRV that we spoke about earlier, and then how the, the strength um, parts of it are stacked. And th there seems to be, now that I've done it for a long time, there's a methodology to all this. I don't understand what it is, but <laughs> it exists. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Fortunately I do. Right. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the key is, is the key is always, what are we trying to accomplish? Right. And, and in this program in particular, we're, we're trying to improve mostly the aerobic system. We're not trying to break world records in, in powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting. We're not trying to turn you into, into a, a massively muscled strength athlete because that's not really the best thing for, for longevity or most performances. So it's, it's about trying to build that aerobic capacity. And that means trying to build the heart, the lungs, the muscular capacity, this entire metabolic machinery around making oxygen produce more energy for your body. That's what aerobic fitness ultimately is. So the weightlifting piece, the, the metabolic conditioning piece, that's the aim of it. Now, as you've probably seen over the years, there's been this big debate on metabolic conditioning. We need to do all high intensity. We, you, you can't do anything low intensity or, you know, 80 years, eight, 10 years ago, it was, it was all slow stuff. And now it's kind of come back to it. But really what it comes down to is what I talked about. It, it's, it's progression and stress. So the reason you're not sore is because I didn't start you out on day one as you were doing on day 90 or whatever the case may be. It's, it's got to be this gradual, progressive dialing up that stress over time as your body gets better to it, better at it, I should say. It's progression. So you start out at certain volumes and certain intensities. And if you really start looking at details in our program, it's week by week, small increments. It's not like these massive jumps from one week to the next to the next. It's small jumps. But over a six, eight week, 12 week period, your, your actual training has increased significantly, but I did it in a gradual way. I let the body respond and recover to it. And then I upped it just a little bit more. And then I go through that process over and over again. So again, if you look at like sets and reps and time, you'll see that the changes from week to week are gradual. It's not like you're going from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. You're going from 30 minutes to 35 minutes and 35 minutes to maybe 38 minutes or 40. It's, it's small changes over time. And I find that the biggest problem that people do in the strength and condition world is they jump around with way too many exercises, way too many methods. And the only thing that they drive their program with is intensity or how hard the workout felt as a measuring stick, but that's not a very good measuring stick. So the biggest thing like I said, you'll see in the program versus most is I don't build it from an exercise standpoint. I give people a lot of freedom in the exercises. I build it from that stress standpoint of how much total stress is that work you're going to put somebody under. And I gradually dial that up over time because I know their body is going to gradually need more and more to continue to improve, but I don't need to jump to week eight at week one because you're not going to be able to cope with that much stress. It's, it's just this progression. So it really is about small incremental changes over periods of time where the body gradually builds up better and better results. And that's what, you know, people do that to some extent on the strength train side, but they don't really know how to do it very well on the metabolic side, which is probably the biggest difference in what you're going to see from my programs versus other people's programs. There's just no progression. There's no underlying structure. It's just like do a bunch of hard work or do a bunch of long, slow work. And there's no real uh, methodology behind that. It's just kind of the same thing over and over again. So I want, I want to touch on a couple of things in the program. Um, I am, I am not twice as strong as I was. I'm not twice as big. I think I've gained I'm about six or seven pounds heavier. Um, I can't bench press twice what I could. Sure. Talk to me about how can I do twice as many pushups? How is my aerobic system interacting with, you know, helping with my pushups? What's the, how does that interact? Sure. I mean, something that's, let's say a one repetition bench press, that would be almost entirely anaerobic, right? Mm -hmm. You're not really using much aerobic fitness aerobic energy to do a one rep max, but the more and more repetitions you go out of anything, the more important the aerobic system becomes, because if you did have to do 20 reps and it was all entirely anaerobic, you would fail very quickly because the anaerobic system is very short lived. And it basically means your internal environment changed rapidly and it caused fatigue. The more we can develop the aerobic system and the more work it can contribute 
the longer you can do something for. It's really that simple. So this it's a really simple rule of thumb that the more anaerobic energy you have to produce, the, the less time you can produce overall energy for because greater reliance on anaerobic metabolism means you fatigue a lot faster. So all we've done is made your aerobic system so much better to the point that it, it can contribute more toward your push-ups and more towards even your pull-ups to some extent to where you're using slightly less anaerobic and you're using more aerobic. It means you can do it longer. It really is that simple. Plus your body is just trained to be able to continue to perform in that somewhat anaerobic environment because you've done it over and over again. The body gets used to it. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm fine here. I can keep going. It, it doesn't shut down as, as quickly because a lot of fatigue is, is I wouldn't say it, mental is not the right word, but it's, it's controlled by the brain. So for example, your, your actual muscles never run out of ATP. That would kill you. So your, your total muscle level of ATP never drops below, I don't know, 40 to 60% of what it is at rest. It's not like you run out of energy. It's that all of these signals within the muscle cells and within the surrounding supporting structures start to get closer and closer towards that direction. And the, the brain says no more of that it, it, it causes muscular fatigue as that direction starts to go too fast in that direct in, in, in the lack of energy. So anyway, your, your body just gets much better at dealing with those states. And at the same time, the aerobic system is much better doing its job. So you can do more of it. And, you know, really at the end of the day, that's what fitness is. It's, it's ability to cope with the stress you put your body under and the better you get at that, the more you can do. Um, then within the aerobic system, um, there's the aerobic lactic and analactic and yep. how those are calibrated, uh, according to your recovery with, um, like I measure my HRV every morning, I register my resting heart rate. And so how are these three zones, um, how do they slide up and down based on my HRV? Sure. I mean, that's, that's where the magic of Morpheus and, and kind of what I built around that is intensity is relative. And what I mean by that is if you're already tired, then it takes less to make you more tired. If you're already in a hole, the same amount of digging will get you deeper if you started from fresh ground, more or less. So what I built with Morpheus is a way to say, okay, well, here's where you are today. And then here's what is max effort for you as a result of that versus, you know, this kind of normal way of approaching metabolic conditioning has been take your max heart rate and then divide it up into zones, right? So hundred percent of your max heart rate is max intensity. Then you have 90% above is zone five, and then 85% or whatever. They, 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 there's a very kind of formulaic way of going about it, but stress is relative. You know, like I said, if you're already tired, then the same run or the same lift or whatever is going to be much more fatiguing to you than if you were very, very fresh when you started. It's that simple. It's, it's relative to your state now because stress is relative. So what Morpheus does is it looks at, okay, here's David's recovery, right? And it says, okay, well, based on that, here's what's considered high intensity for him. Here's what's considered more moderate intensity. And here's what's considered low intensity. And again, like you mentioned, that, that adjusts daily based on how much stress you're under and what your recovery shows. So it's, it's really just taking the, the, the math behind the scenes and figuring out what is high stress for you today, what's low stress and what's moderate stress. And that depends on the day, it depends how much sleep you got, depends on what you did yesterday, depends on all those things. And so it's, it's personalizing that intensity and personalizing that dial for you on a given day, which just makes the program more, more personal to you, more, more uh, adapted to your body and less one size fits all. And there's, um, so we have these three zones, um, aerobic, lactic, analactic, which is quite different from if I go to like a HIIT training class, right? Um, wh where that's not, they're not really taking that into account. They're just like here. Yeah. I mean, fast. that's, again, that's, that's kind of the problem, right? With, with mass market fitness and mass market classes, you're in the same class with somebody else who has very different needs and very different capabilities and very different fitness levels. But you're an individual person, your genetics are different, your environment's different, your fitness levels are different. So it's, it's very, very challenging to get what your body actually needs out of a large group class. Like, yes, you can, you can sort of work hard and that's, that's fine and you can get a workout. But I think the difference between what you're seeing in my program and what most people see go to classes is there's a difference between a workout and a program. That's really what it comes down to. A workout is just something that makes you sweat, something that pushes your body, but there's no progression. Right. There, there, there's not this ability to gradually ramp things up over time, 
to gradually adjust to your body as your fitness levels change to adjust on a daily basis, depending on your stress levels, you're just going in and you're working hard and you're getting a workout, which again, that's, it's better than doing nothing for sure, but you're not going to get the same level of results as if you build a program specifically designed around your body and then adjust it to your body as you progress through it, which is ultimately what you're seeing in metamorphosis as you're going through it. It's, it's this personalized element that makes all the difference in the world because we're all different and when you treat us all the same, we're not going to all get the same results. It's, it's about finding what works for you and your body. So let, let's talk a little bit about HIIT training. Um, and, you know, I mean, I find that if I do, I can, I'm, I'm old, man. <laughs> I can only, like, if I do like a max push sort of workout, like, you know, close to my max heart rate for, and the most I can do that for is like 10 seconds and I just sure. die. Um, you know, rest and I can do like a couple of rounds of that. That is extraordinarily stressful on my body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you, there, you know, you hear people talking about doing, you know, hit training three and four times a week. And, you know, you know, what are the dangers of that? Yeah, look, it, it's like I said, unfortunately, the fitness industry is a very uh, pendulum swinging field where, something gets popular and then the pendulum swings all that direction. Everybody wants to do it. And then people realize, wait a minute, that was kind of stupid. Maybe we should try something a little different. And then it swings the opposite direction. So, you know, when the, the, the Tabata interval study and and a bunch of other hit studies started coming out, the, the big word was, Oh, look at four weeks or six weeks, you know, the high intensity hit study outperformed the lower intensity study. So that's just all you need to do. Well, it's BS because the lack of context of your life isn't four weeks or six weeks. And when you started actually, looking at these longer term pictures and a few longer term studies that got less publicized, your results plateau very quickly when you do that. So simple rule is greater stress, greater effect, faster plateau. I mean, that's what it comes down to. So yeah, if I only have four weeks to train for something and that's it, then I'm going to use quite a bit of intensity because I'm going to see a very quick response, but I'm then going to plateau very quickly. And if I keep trying to up that further, eventually I'm going to hit a point where I can't recover and I'm screwed. So when you see people talking about this, oh, you hit three days a week, four days a week, five days a week, either one of two things, either they're very young and they can recover fairly quickly and they're not doing as much of it as they think they are, or two, they're so fatigued by, by workout two or three, it's not as high intensity as they think it is, or three, they are doing that and they're going to pay the price and it's going to lead to overtraining, mitochondrial dysfunction, hormone burnout, you know, all the stuff that we see in the classic overtraining pattern. And, you know, I I always think it's funny because, you know, I've worked with, I don't even know how many world champion level athletes in combat sports at this point. And 90% of the training year, our athletes do two days a week of what I consider true high intensity, two days of real sparring, two days of real high intensity metabolic conditioning of some form. Like that's it. Two days a week is about all the average person, even not even average, but even like world class level athletes, like two days a week of what is really high intensity is all that you can do. It's, it's about what your body can recover from effectively. If you're doing six days, I mean, yeah, you can do 10 minutes a day of it, but that isn't really a good approach. You need more volume than that. So I just tell pretty much everybody it's, it's really simple. You can do about two days and, and you get the, the older category brackets, probably one day is all you need. The rest of the time needs to be less than less than maximal because Again, it's it's a really simple rule that, yeah, you put your body in more stress, it'll adapt faster, but that means it'll also plateau and go downhill the other direction faster. It's a much steeper curve, both up and back down. And again, the question is always, how do you feel? Are you actually improving? You know, like if you can't answer, yes, I feel good. And yes, I'm improving. Then you're doing too much. It really is that simple. And the value of self-restraint. You know? Yeah, it, it is. Well, like I said, it's, People do remarkable things if they believe it's going to help them. But when you actually take a step back and ask yourself, hey, wait, am I getting better? Am I actually getting the reward from all this killing myself in the gym? And if the answer is no, then stop. Yeah, that's that's right. And and I think that there's there's this misnomer out there, this misunderstanding about equating suffering and yes. pain with progress. Yeah, right. <laughs> Those that, aren't that the is. same it's, thing. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this, this mentality of no pay, no gain and, you know, pay the price if you want to get the reward. But I, I have a really simple rule for most people. I would say 80, 90% of the time when you walk out of the gym, 
you should feel at least as good as when you walked in. And if not better, you should not walk out of the gym feeling exhausted and defeated and destroyed because that, that, that is not what the body is going to respond well to. Like, yes, you should feel like you got to work out. You should feel tired, but you should not slowly walk out of the gym because you're so beat up. You can't walk any faster. <laughs> um, let's, let's circle back to this um, aerobic fitness. Sure. So how long it, it seems as though building aerobic capacity is a real long-term thing, um, you know, possibly years. I mean, it depends on the level you're talking about getting to the, the great thing about the aerobic system is it's highly, highly adaptable because it's, it's the system that drives, you know, 99 plus percent of your, your energy throughout your entire lifetime. So there are a lot of moving pieces and there, there are of course genetics involved just like anything else. Certain people are, much more highly predisposed to, to respond very quickly to aerobic training. And some people are much more anaerobically driven and easier have an easier time gaining strength and power than they do the endurance side. So there are pieces that come over a shorter period of time and there are pieces that come over longer periods of time. So for example, like your slower twitch muscle fibers, they're meant to be aerobic. They're highly aerobic. They can adapt really quickly. Um, the muscles that are more fast twitch and more anaerobic dominant, they're going to take more time because that's not what they're necessarily inherently as good at um your your heart itself and and remodeling the heart to have more pumping capacity by enlarging the left ventricle a bit and making it more elastic so it can pump out more blood that's going to take a bit longer building blood vessels and vascularization that's going to take longer so there there are just different pieces that get developed over periods of time and of course someone who's been trained their whole life has got all of those if someone's never really done much aerobic training at all. Yeah. It's going to take you quite a while to really build those out. But the thing is you you should see improvements and progress along the way, right? Someone who's going from I'm on the couch to I want to run a marathon can do that in a, you know, I've, I've had people do it in nine months or less that literally went from zero training that just sit on the couch and, and maybe a bit overweight to being able to complete a marathon, you know, in six, nine, 12 months, that's possible. And that's a really impressive thing that the body can adapt very quickly to it. So um, that is, like I said, that's, that's really the kind of the hallmark of the aerobic system. It's highly adaptable. There's lots of pieces in the chain and that gives us lots of room for improvement over both the short term, medium term. And then of course, the long term as you continue going. Um, let's move towards, um, calorie burn and body composition yeah, about the, <laughs> this idea that, um, you know, our bodies compensate for the amount of energy we're burning in a certain way. And, you know, maybe this isn't the best way to lose weight. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 again, it's a very common thing. Like, Oh, uh, if I go 20,000 steps a day, I'm burning more calories. And if I go 10,000 steps a day, and that means I'm going to, therefore I'm going to lose X more pounds or to think like if I, if I only had a high metabolism, then I would lose weight faster. Well, the best person to research here, I don't know if you've had him on your show is, is, you know, Dr. Herman Fonzer. He's done, a ton of area on, on metabolic function, just proven a lot of this stuff. You know, one, people with higher resting metabolic rates are not inherently more likely to be lean or, or less likely to be overweight than people with slower metabolic resting rates because we subconsciously just adapt our food intake in, in lots of ways. And we adapt to everything else that we're doing around that. So the body is, is inherently so adaptable and dynamic that you can't just say, oh, I'm going to dial up my metabolic rate and boom, my, my fat's going to melt off. No, you will subconsciously adjust everything that happens to try to maintain that way. Your body doesn't really want to lose weight. It's, it's not great for survival to be very lean, right? If, if there was some sort of, you know, world ending famine, the people who had the largest stores of fat would be in a better position to survive because they'd have more energy stores in their body. So we're just not inherently designed to be lean. That's kind of a, a, a way to start out this conversation, but because of that, our body has lots of ways to adapt to things that we do to it. And that again is, is taking into account exercise and diet and everything else. And we adjust, we adapt to that sort of thing. So the biggest thing is the, the greater you try to, uh, the, word, the, the bigger cuts you try to make, the more the body wants to respond. So trying to go in a huge caloric deficit of thousand plus calories, or trying to ramp your exercise up, you know, fivefold and go from, 2000 steps a day to 20,000 steps a day, that causes the body to change very quickly because it doesn't like it. it. It does not like these huge perturbations and it doesn't like this idea that it has very little nutrient intake and very high energy output. And that's going to cause a response. And as we mentioned, the body can respond in numerous ways. Some of them 
some of them are outward and some of them are just completely psychological. You'll find yourself craving foods that are more calorically dense or more sugar dense. You'll find yourself moving less in between workouts and decreasing um, what's called NEAT or non-exercise type movement and energy use. So there's just a lot of things, both conscious and subconscious that the body does to try to um, you know, prevent these huge losses in weight and these, these huge swings. So that's, again, where it comes down to stress management. If your goal is weight loss, it's got to be looked at as a, a long-term prospect, not a three-week, six-week you know, uh, burst of trying to drop as much as you can in a short period of time. Because I can tell you a story. I, I, I did this myself. Uh, I did a DEXA scan, which for your listeners aren't too familiar, it's, it's really the most accurate way to, to gauge uh, body fat changes and muscular changes and bone density and those sorts of things. And it's become more popular these days for that purpose. But I did a, I was, I was trying basically a, a low carb strategy where I'd go real low carb, low calorie during the week. And then I would blast myself with calories and carbs in the weekend and then repeat this. And it was a pretty popular strategy. And I basically just want to see what happens. So I cut my calories way down during the week and then I loaded in the weekend. And then I tested my body fat and DEXA again, I think it was like six or eight weeks later. Um, and my body total body weight was almost identical, but I literally lost four pounds of muscle and gained four pounds of fat. Hmm. And so, you know, from a scale weight, I made, it made zero difference, but my body basically redistributed itself by getting rid of that muscle mass and turning it essentially into fat. And the reason that I did that is because when I'm in a very calorically uh, deprived state, right? My body says, Hey, I don't have enough nutrients coming in. What is something it wants to do? Well, it says you've got all this muscle mass sitting around. It's taking up a lot of energy. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. That's the extra baggage, right? Like that's the plane falling out of the sky. You want to throw everything heavy out of that plane so you can glide <laughs> a little bit further. So when you put your body in these states that are you know, highly calorically uh, you know, restricted, for long periods of time, I'm not saying short periods of time, but you know, a week, five, six days is, is a lot. I was burning a ton of muscle and I was still lifting weights. I was still doing those things and it wasn't enough for me. And I was in my thirties then. So you can see that when you put your body in a state where it doesn't have many nutrients and, and the food that it wants, again, sure, it'll burn some fat usually, uh, but it's going to burn muscle first and muscle most. And if you start actually looking at like the the diet studies, like the problem with diet studies is a lot of times they're not measuring DEXA. They're just measuring scale weight. And so you see these like, oh, they lost eight pounds. But then if you look at other studies, they do look at DEXA. You're like, wait a minute, like that was 80% muscle loss. <laughs> like mm. it, it wasn't really the muscle mass they should have been losing. They want to lose the fat. So again, I think it's misleading if you just look at scale weight. Because in my example, I would have been like, oh, I stayed the same. But no, I actually made a significantly worse body composition change because my calories during those five days was just way too low. And then my body was like, you know, get rid of muscle mass, get rid of muscle mass. Right. And then I taken these huge influx of calories. My body was like, great, store fat, store fat, store fat. Right. <laughs> so if you push your body in this environment where it thinks that it's got a, you know, a big need for, for storing calories, the best place to storm is not muscle. It's storm is fat because fat's less metabolically demanding than muscle. The more muscle you have, the more energy you're going to need, the, the more fat you have, the more energy you have stored. So your body is going to store fat much easier than build muscle. Um, so I help me to what are your thoughts on rather than lo, sort of long term fasting? Um, so let's say we'll call it a time restricted feeding, like eating within a ten hour, twelve hour window, eight hour window. Some people it, it personally doesn't that doesn't work for me. But um, yeah, I, I think I, this yeah this this is an important topic. I think because. You know, when you look at the research and you get on the people that do this for a living, they look at animal research and caloric restriction is the single most consistent thing that shows increases in longevity across mm -hmm. a wide variety of animals, right? But there's a lot of caveats to that, right? The, in the studies, you're talking about an animal that's, you know, in a cage for its entirety of its life. It's not having to adapt to the stress of all these different things. And these mice and these different animals are generally not exercising with any sort of controlled manner. They're just sitting in a cage. And if you cut their calories way back, and again, caloric restriction is like 20 to 30% less than what they eat if they mm -hmm. were to eat, uh, you know, at live and just whatever they wanted to eat. So that's a huge reduction. That's like taking a 30 year calories out. And in such cases, they do live longer. 
the other thing to consider is mice and these animals, generally speaking, you know, even when they're given the normal amount of food, they don't die of cardiovascular disease as much. They die of cancer. So you cut back the rate of cancer and boom, you extend their lifespan and, you, and their health span, these sorts of things. So there's benefits to this. There's no doubt that there is something that happens when you have periods of caloric restriction and intermittent fasting can be a part of that. But basically what you're, what you're doing, and, and it makes sense is when, when you are nutrient deprived for, you know, shorter periods of time, well, it doesn't matter. Your body is saying, okay, I need to get better at surviving on fewer calories. And I can focus on things like autophagy and recycling the, the more damaged components. And I can uh, basically kind of go out and clean up the mess that is in my body and make it run more efficiently. And there's benefits to that. But where it becomes less beneficial is when you go from, you know, a day or, or you know, day and a half of that to all the time, which is what most dieting is. And then when you mm -hmm. shove massive calories in the back end of that, it defeats a lot of the purpose of that. So I think, and I personally do some variation of intermittent fast. I don't do it every single day. I don't do time restricted feeding every day, but I do periods of it. And I think there's benefits to doing short runs of it. And then there's periods of focusing on the other side of it, which is building muscle and building strength and being more anabolic. There are value. There is a value to using um, time restricted feeding or caloric restriction, not 30%, but in smaller amounts in doses. And those doses have an effect. I'd say, the, think of it like, um, you know, like exercise in the right amounts. It's really good in too much. It's not good. It's bad. It can have negative effects. So I think there's, there's value in it, but it has to be done right. And for the most part, you're, you're talking in about much smaller benefits than you get from exercise itself. And I think a lot of these, a lot of longevity people are talking about caloric restriction and intermittent fasting. And yeah, if somebody is unhealthy, then those are good tools. But exercise is, again, the single most powerful tool we have. If you're exercising all the time, you're getting enough sleep, your overall calories and, and macronutrients where they need to be, they're, they're probably fairly marginally benefits to adding that on top. Not that there are none, but get all the big things squared away first before you run into, you know, intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding or longer periods of fasting. Like, those things are fine, but get all the other things that are more important dialed in first and then look at those things. Um, I, I think my, when I started eight weeks out, I think my caloric content, my caloric consumption went up like a third. <laughs> <laughs> like I, uh, you know, I've gone from like not eating a lot of carbs to I go through like a huge bag of oatmeal, like once a week um, that like, I need that fuel in my body yeah, and, that, and that's your body cycle lot again that's kind of that psychological like your body's responding to the environment by getting you to eat more of the foods you need to eat which is a good thing right yeah yeah um the um there's a couple little things i want to hit on here and then i um some of our readers have written in with sure. questions for you yeah absolutely um so what's the talk to me about outdoor training versus indoor training why why do you want people to train outdoors I think it goes, like I said, it goes back to environmental. Um, not that if the choice is train uh, outside or don't train at all, then yeah, train inside. Um, but just anecdotally speaking from myself, from people I coached over the years, I, I have, you know, I said, I had a gym in Seattle for many years and we had a garage door that would open up and we were in an area we could go run down a trail. I would just kind of anecdotally would see people recover faster and I would see their HRVs better during the summer months when they were outside more, they got vitamin D and maybe it's just Seattle because it's only sunny for a few months of the year, but you just see people's overall response to training better when you're outside. And I think there's just something um, environmentally and, and mentally that you see benefits in being outside and training and people I know that are the healthiest and kind of the happiest, they're outside more of their lives. And then, so we go to Hawaii and again, Hawaii is, if I remember correctly, Hawaii is like 11th or 12th in the, the U.S. in terms of like fitness level, which who knows how they're measuring that, but it's number one in life expectancy. Well, mm. why is it number one life expectancy? Because you can be outdoors and you can be active year round because you're around the ocean and, and the beauty of the terrain out there and because the environment itself is much less stressful. So mm. I just think there's value, um, whether you measure it directly or not, in spending your time training outdoors. I mean, if you hate being in the mountains, I'm not saying going to the mountains, but just in general, being outside has uh, some beneficial effects from the sun to just the overall, um, you know, exposure to the environment that you're, you're in. It, it seems to be for most people, at least, you know, in the numbers I've seen and, and just anecdotally, my own numbers going to Hawaii versus 
living in Seattle, it, it, it's a remarkable jump. I see my HRV jump three, five points or more when I, when I get to Hawaii and, and I'm able to train outside year round out there. So I think if you can, if you live in a place, I'm not saying go, go run a dangerous spot, but if you have the ability to train outside versus on a treadmill, you're, you're going to see benefits. Um, yeah, I, I live in the, the, the mountains of park city, Utah. Um, yeah, you get it. So, yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Uh, there, and and I just wanted to ask you on a, on a personal level, Joel, your father, um, you, you've had your, both your mom and your dad have had some, you know, cardiovascular issues. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had my, my family definitely does not, uh, bode well in the, the cardiovascular genetics, uh, or side. So my, my mom had her first stroke or her main stroke when they're in her sixties, then she had to have uh, some stents put in her heart because she would have had a heart attack had she not done that. Then she got breast cancer, sarcoidosis, the lung, it's kind of a whole mm. range of things. And then my dad, his, his grandpa, my, my grandpa on my dad's side died at 61 or 62. My grandpa on my mom's side died at 62. My dad had his first heart attack in his mid fifties and then had a, a bypass in I think 61, 62 and he passed away. So it's not like these, it's not like the men, the men are all dying literally early sixties. It's not, old and none of them were overweight. Uh, none of them were lack, you know, had no activity. Like they were all fairly active. They were all fairly, uh, normal in the body weight sense. And they're all dying very young. My mom was 110 pounds. So my mom was clearly not overweight, didn't have any body comp issues and kind of your traditional model of what it looks like. And you know, it's, it's genetics. I, I basically, I, I look at my blood a lot. I measure a range of different markers every six months or so. And the biggest thing I see is my family is very predisposed towards low HDL, mm. uh, sorry, yeah, low HDL and higher LDL than you'd expect. So mm. if, if I don't do anything, my HDL will be in the tank and my LDL will be higher than it, much higher than it should be given my dietary intake and my activity levels. So there's probably other things going on, but that's the biggest thing I see personally is my HDL should be way higher, um, kind of given what I'm doing and my LDL should be lower and it's, it's not. So the best way to manage that is, is managing inflammation and keep my inflammation very low, keep, keep my triglycerides very low, keeping a very good level of insulin sensitivity, you know, just managing my metabolic function as, as effective as I can. Cause if you keep your HDL, if your HDL can't get very high, you have to keep your LDL even lower as part of that. And I also look at the lipo profile to see the size of the particles and some more, more detailed stuff. I have a cardiologist I've been working with, um, but by all accounts, my numbers are really, really good. And despite that, everything else, um, I think you, you guys mentioned Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker has my my inner age at 33, which is 10 years less than oh I actually God. am. That's so, great. Yeah. So if I'm, even if I just like by 10 years, I'll, you know, I make it 73, that's still a big improvement. But, I, you know, hope, obviously I want to make it much longer than that. Um, but I've been mindful of this, you know, since my early 30s. And my the cardiologist is like, why do you want to come to me? You're 30, right? And I said, well, here's my family history better start now than later. So like I said, I get my, all my blood tests, I get done every six months or so. And I keep an eye on, on all these markers and, you know, my testosterone is high, good, good number for my age group, at least my blood sugar and, and all these numbers are, are really good. And I have really good insulin sensitivity. So yeah, my HCL is not great. It's like upper thirties, low forties, which isn't terrible now, but it's been much lower in the past. And my LDL hover is now right around hundred, 110, which isn't, which isn't too bad. So I've been able to improve those things. Um, as well over time. Plus I deliberately dropped weight. I used to walk around at 220, 230. Now I'm at 195, mm -hmm. uh, which also has helped improve my numbers. Just, you know, I feel better at a lower body weight uh, and less, less fat and leaner. So, you know, I'm doing everything I can to, to live, live as long as I can and, and stay healthy and, and active in the process and, you know, just doing the things I enjoy doing. I, I think, what you did by going to a cardiologist in your thirties is something everyone should do that I, this idea that like, we're going to treat, um, you know, you get a CT scan of your heart, you're looking at the calcium and it's like, Oh, well, the numbers are up. I guess we're going to do something. Yep. I, what they don't tell you is it took you 40 years to accumulate. That. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, stop it before it starts. Yeah, like, yep. I mean, my brother had a, um, not a full blown heart attack, but pretty close in his mid forties and had to get a couple of stents put in. So like, Ooh. you know, like I said, if you have really bad genetics and you have a shitty lifestyle, it can catch up with you pretty fast. And I, I didn't want to go down that route. And 
fortunately, I found a very, a very good cardiologist who, who did a full mock-up or blood work and looked at everything, you know, and said, look, here, here's where I see, you know, genetically probably what you're, what you're seeing. Cause I'd done my blood work before that. Um, and he said, normally, you know, you could, he's like, normally at your age, you would never put someone on a statin, but he's like, in the, you know, a lot of doctors probably would look at this and give it to you, but he, he recommended red rice yeast. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of has some naturally occurring statin. And I started mm -hmm. doing that and I've been doing it ever since. And it's it definitely knocked my LDL down uh, noticeably. But again, most doctors wouldn't even consider looking at somebody in their thirties that's by all accounts healthy and works out four or five days a week and think they need to look at anything cardiovascularly. They just wait until they, you know, came in with a chest pain or something <laughs> in their fifties and then try to treat it. So yeah, I think it's, it's uh, awareness and proactive approaches are, by far the, the most important way to prevent these things than, than to just wait until you uh, have a real problem. And, and now you, like you said, you've accumulated the damage. If you accumulate yeah. the damage, undoing it is, is not going to happen. A, not going to happen. We can't, re <laughs> yeah. we can't reverse uh, arthrosclerosis at this point. So once it's there, it's there. You got to prevent it building up in the first place. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I got a real problem with, you know, what I call like medicine 2.0 that like, we're not going to deal with it until it's a problem. Well, come on, guys. Yeah. Like, stop the problem from happening. We can do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we know that here's the thing. We know the mechanisms. Like we understand what causes cardiovascular disease. We understand yeah. a lot of contributing factors for cancers. Like we, we know a lot of the things that are warning signs way before you get there. And we have the tools and technology and the methodology to fix these things. It's just a matter of changing the, the model. And, you know, my mom declined progressively over the years, you know, after she had the stroke, it, it just caused a series of, of things where she didn't want to move and her lack of movement made it even worse. And I just watched her entire mobility spiral down the drain to the last two of years of her life. She was probably spending 20 hours on the, the couch or the bed watching game shows and kind of waiting to die, unfortunately, because that's, that's what her life quality looked like. And I don't blame her for not wanting to live that life, but she you know, if she had been able to stop that process before she ever had the stroke, her entire end of her life would have been significantly different. And she made it to 78, uh, despite all of that, if she had, you know, not had that stroke and not had that decline, she would have lived well into her, her 80s because for not, not unfortunately, fortunately, the women in my family live much longer uh, than the men. My grandma lived till 86, despite smoking for 70 plus years and, and uh, drinking for probably a good percentage of those two and never working a day in her life. She just had some really good uh, German genes and she got lung cancer and she was 82. They told her she had six months and she made it four years later than that. So the women seem to be very resilient in that side of my family, but the men are not. So I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to uh, not join that club. Uh, so I want to just um, talk about my personal situation here. Um, so I started, um, eight weeks out essentially to train for, um, the sport that I enjoy, which is skiing, which oh, yeah. starts in about a month. Yep. I, I grew up skiing with a ski instructor in college too. So I appreciate oh, that. Awesome. Um, I, you'll love this. So at age 64, I'm going to do a five day a week master ski racing program. I've never ski raced in my life. Um, and you know, I've now, I've got some muscle on me. So if I fall, I hopefully won't like damage too much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I've, um, so I've now sort of switched to doing very sports specific stuff. Sure. So, um, you know, one legged lunges, Bulgarians, a lot of stuff with like an elastic band around my waist and jumping around for balance yep. and things like BOSU balls, stuff like that. Yep. So what I'm doing is keeping the um the aerobic training part of eight weeks and then sort of substituting in doing these um very sort of lower sports body specific, sure. stuff sports specific like twice a week um and then um, just regular push-up pull-up stuff like twice a week yep um how's that sound sounds great i mean that's that's okay. exactly what you want to be doing i mean the you know when i read the program it's a very generalized you know, general fitness goal, because I don't know what each person is training for, but ultimately you look at this, the demand of skiing, it's obviously very lower body intensive. It's dynamic and multidirectional and and doing the sorts of things you're doing jumps and hops and lateral work and uh, mm -hmm. rotational stuff. That's going to make a big difference. And like the, the big best benefit is because you've developed your the aerobic system so high at this point, you're going to adapt to that stuff much faster than if you hadn't done that first. So you, you've built 
a really solid foundation. You know, you, you can do that many pull-ups and, and weight pull-ups and you can do that many push-ups. I mean, in your HRV, you've got a, a very good foundation of, of all around adaptability, I would say. And that's going to make all the other exercises you're doing now uh, even more effective because you're going to be recover and adapt to them so much more quicker, so much quicker than if you hadn't built that foundation first. Hmm. Okay. Good to know. Um, so I've got a few questions here from people who um, knew you were coming on the show. Sure. Uh, the first one here, um, if one were to plan out a full year training program around some key event, like an Ironman, 100 mile run, CrossFit championship, et cetera, would eight weeks out be a continuous part of the year schedule? For example, level one, then some amount of rest recovery, level two, and then some amount of rest recovery, and then repeat for a full year, or should it be used as more of a base for some period of time before more specific training is engaged? So in general, your, your training is always going to progress from what I would call general, meaning exercises are they're broader and less specific to your sport. Even the time frames of work and rest start out more general and work more specific. That should always occur towards any type of event. So if you've got a particular event, right, like a hundred miler, you're not going to be doing the same thing three weeks from away from that as you're doing three months from that. You want to gradually make your training much more specific to the actual thing that you're trained for. So you want to basically break up your year into the events that you're trained for and build up and peak for those events. Give yourself a little bit of a break or a recovery period after that event, and then kind of repeat that process for the next event. Now, obviously, if it's the same event three times, that's a lot easier than if it's three different events with three different demands. But just in general, you want to build the foundation further out, and then you want to get better at using that foundation, using that fitness towards that specific event, the closer you get to it. So for example, if I'm training a combat athlete and he just finished a fight, we're going to go in the gym. We're going to build whatever areas of fitness we think he's lacking the most, or she's lacking the most in. And then as we get closer to the fight, it's going to be a lot more fight specific trains like you're doing now. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't look at like this yearly picture so much as like this event based picture and make your workouts and your program built around those particular events. So you can peak on those at those events, and then you can give yourself a chance to recover and then go through the process again. Um, next question. If one were to start a cycle, uh, level one, then rest a week, then level two, but we're also training for an endurance event at the same time, could the conditioning portion of each workout, assuming adherence to each workout specific methods, SS1, upper blue, tempo intervals, et cetera, be 2X, 5X, or even 10X the time difference? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the time difference. You're talking about just large, larger volumes of those methods? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the methods are really the framework of how you are causing your body to adapt. You have to then look at what your body is capable of, right? Somebody who's never done this sort of work is going to have much less ability to respond to volume than somebody who's trained for a very high-level endurance event that's already got those specific qualities. So you can take all, all the methods I used can be uh, applied to any fitness level or any goal, you just scale up and down the volume intensity. So yeah, you can absolutely use the conditioning methods and you have to figure out what volumes are appropriate for your fitness level. And endurance athletes can do certainly far more than somebody in level one who's just starting out. But the methods are the methods. They, they're what cause the changes in the body you want to happen. And you just pick the right volumes and, and levels and methods for you. So you can use the framework, but yeah, you would adjust the volumes. And then um, third question here is, if somebody has some kind of event um, in the middle of, say, a level one or level two cycle, so and and so the rhythm of the the program gets broken. Um, there's been a deviation. How sure. how so? How do you get back into that? And where where does one start again? Look, the, the biggest thing is, as you saw, it's a continuation and from week to week, where I'm gradually dialing that that dial up. What I'm trying to avoid is making a huge change in the dial either direction. So if I have a huge swing up in intensity or a huge swing down intensity, that's where the body doesn't like it. So whatever you did during that week off or whatever period where you went away from the program, you'd want to kind of jump back in with a small change from what you just did. So what I mean is, let's say I took a week and I went for competition. I wouldn't want to then just dial you know, the gauge two notches back up to the next week. I'd want to just gradually increase from where I was again. Everything is about small gradiated uh, improve, you know, increases. So it depends on what you did in the off week you know, or the two weeks off. It depends on what you did. I can't say immediately go back to week two or immediately go back to week three. It depends on what you did during that off period 
just take whatever that was and gradually ramp it up. Whether that means going to week four in the program, if you skipped week three, or it means going back to week three, it just depends on what you did when you weren't following the program. Uh, Joel, is there anything you want to leave people with? Um, you yeah, know, I said, like I said, I think my biggest focus with people is helping them understand how to make the biggest impact. And mostly that comes down to finding the things in your lifestyle that are the biggest limitations. Like, yeah, I'm, okay, you do all the great things, at the gym, but you're not getting enough sleep or you get enough sleep, but your diet is really poor. I think a lot of times people want to focus on these like little things, like, should I intermittent fast? Should I not? That's a great question to ask, but look at the big picture of your lifestyle. If, if you just nail the three big things, like if you just consistently work out, I mean, obviously the eight weeks out program I wrote is great, but even just doing some sort of consistent workout, the right volume and intensities for you, whatever it looks like, getting enough sleep, you know, eating the, the main supplements and our main foods that we know are healthy in the right amounts. You know, if you get those things, those two things light, right, you'll be 90% of the way there. And then if you can manage the mental stress side, you'll be 99% of the way there. And then you can look at all these additional things, right? I think people get too caught up in these, in the minutia and the small details of, of this thing or that new shiny thing. But it's the big picture that is the big picture. And if you can get those things right, you're going to have a whole lot more success with the little details that you start digging into. I've just seen too many people dig into this regeneration strategy or that regeneration strategy. Should I do cryo? Should I do cold plunge? Well, shit, if you're sleeping six hours, I don't care what you do or five hours, like that's <laughs> not going to make a big difference. So um, the, the message is, look, we all age. There's no way around that, unfortunately, but we all control how we age. And that is something that I think we all need to consider no matter how old we are, whether you're 20 or 60 or 80, we can all control the process and we can, can slow it down or unfortunately we can speed it up. And if you focus on slowing it down as much as possible, I think you'll live a much higher quality life and you'll be glad that you did. There's a, I'm a pilot recreationally and there was a group of uh, octogenarian 80 year old pilots that met up at a, a diner that I fly in and out of quite a bit. And, you know, they were all just full of life and they were passionate about flying and they had all these endless stories about flying around and doing these things. And, you know, like that's the life I want to live. I want to be in my eighties talking about these crazy flying stories and, things I did when I was my 50s, 60s, and 70s. And it's possible, right? That we see people do it all the time. It just takes a considered effort and consistently doing the right things and consistently avoiding the wrong things. And fortunately, most people know what those things are, at least to some extent. It's just a matter of doing them. So if you keep that in mind, you'll be on the right track. Very well put. Joel, um, you're the master. Um, so happy that um, we have you on the show. And um, thank you for making me the, the the strong, fit person that I am. I really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you uh, putting the effort and time in, and, and believing the program and seeing the results. And and next time I'm on, I want to hear about how you went out, won the won the master competition <laughs> in the, the ski racing. <laughs> I was trying to stay out of a hospital, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have a problem with that. Uh, you got you got to aim high, go win it. All right, you got it. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on the show today. You know, my takeaway, many takeaways from Joel, he's really the master, um, is what he was saying towards the end that we have it within our power, based on some really simple stuff, to either accelerate or delay the aging process. And it's really up to us to make those choices. So um, get out there and move. Whatever kind of exercise you're doing, it is better than no exercise. The best exercise is the one that you do. Um, if you liked the show today, and we hope you did, we hope you found it useful, please leave us a comment if you can, and you have the ability to leave us up to a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. We would love that. We would really appreciate that. And a big thank you to the sponsors that make this program possible. Timeline Nutrition, keeping your mitochondria on point. Element. Keep your hydration and your electrolytes where they should be. And Inside Tracker, the invaluable dashboard to your inner health. Coming up over the next few weeks, we're going to have a few more of these episodes that have to do with activity, with fitness, with recovery. So stay tuned for those. Um, I know we got a great one next week. Everyone, have a wonderful week. And if you want to hit me up for any reason, david, superage.com. We'll chat. See you then. Take care. Bye now.